Romans chapter 1. I want to draw your attention to 1 through 7. It's such a, a powerful thing, but I want to look at it, and then we want to talk about it a little bit. It says Paul in Romans uh, chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto God, the gospel of God. And then he goes on to say, which he had promised before his prophets in the Holy Scripture concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead, underlying that God with power, and then underlying according to the spirit of holiness, and then under, uh, underlying the word the resurrection from the dead, because that's really what it's about. In verse 5, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So you can see it's just packed with all kinds of great things. But we want to take a look at the introduction, and I hope it's not boring, but we just need to understand where this book came from. Nowhere really in Scripture does it say life is going to be easy. I don't know how we ever came with that thought. You know, people say, just come to Christ. It's going to get easy. No, it's going to get worse. Or just come to Jesus and everything's going to be taken care of. No, a lot of times you're going to be dealt with and God, the Holy Spirit, is going to place his finger and show you everything about your life. And you're going to feel like I've been ripped off in the flesh. Now I'm being dealt with by the Spirit. And now I have to put up with people and I come to church and these Christians, they lie. You know, what's up with this? And so Satan comes after you and the Spirit's coming after you. And you have turned your back on Satan, and he has lost you to the power of Jesus Christ. But you don't feel it. And then you begin to look at Christianity, and it's horrible. Because we say one thing, we begin to do other things. We go out with a pastor. He takes a boat, goes out drinking, smoking, and all of a sudden he has no problem with that whatsoever. Well, you do. And now you're trying to figure out this God and holiness. And if he can do it, I can do it. And so you begin to realize, or... If you have a pastor that doesn't want to do that, then sometimes he goes too far and he lives under the law. And so now you're not living by the grace of God. It really takes a supernatural work to absolutely change your life for the glory of God. And it takes God's power to have yourself die every day to the sins of your life, to walk in love. It takes everything in your ability to love somebody or love a wife or a husband when you're really mad at them. And it takes everything in your heart to come back to church when you've been hurt because you want someone to pay. Life is tough. No, no, no matter how you look at it, someone's going to die. A baby's going to die. Someone's going to get crippled tonight. Someone's going to lose everything. Someone's going to get hit by accident. It's going to kill them. Something's going to happen. It just happens because good and bad things happen to us. And so I'm not insulated or isolated from trials. In fact, there's a big target on my back. In other words, Satan is going to come after me. And the Bible so clearly states that, again, that we are tempted just like you are. So everything you go through, I go through. Sometimes even worse because of where I'm at. And so the position brings the enemy. And so you have problems on the outside, and then you have problems on the inside. You don't do something right, the staff gets mad at you or the board gets mad at you, or the congregation gets mad at you, and then the world loves you. <laughs> you can see you're set up 24-7. So somewhere in our minds, we have come to believe that if I ask Christ into my heart, I should have a great life. That's not true. If you want a great life, you're going to have to work for it. Not in the sense of salvation, but you're going to have to apply the Word of God to your heart and believe it. And you're going to have to take God at his fate value that he says, I'll do it, I'll do it. And you're going to have to believe everything in your heart that God is who he is. So if your knowledge of God is little, you're in a big, you're just in big trouble. Because Satan knows God and knows the scripture and you've just left him. And here God is not telling you everything and Satan's telling you everything. Who are you going to go back to? It's so easy to backslide. And then you do real well and you and a gal slip. Well, 
you didn't slip, you went after her. You know that. So we're not even honest with ourselves. And then, well, what were you doing at that bar? Well, I just got to go maybe ask for a job. No, you didn't. You went there for one reason, because you're lonely, insecure, and you want someone to hold you and be a mother. And you found this gal because she's looking for some daddy. And the next thing you wake up in bed and you find out that she had AIDS. So now you're going to die, so now you're going to blame God for killing you. Why is that? Is that we refuse to take any responsibility. We always want the other person to do it. So the book of Romans comes and says, now wait a second. This whole book is about getting us saved and showing the miraculous gift of God. How he has justified us, redeemed us. And so man is already lawless. He's already wiped out. The world around you is completely messed up. And life just is not fair. And this is what we think. I don't know how we got there, but this book is going to teach you the grace of God. And this book is going to teach you how to learn to deal with issues in your life. And Paul is going to go through this book and teach it in a very powerful way as a lawyer. He's going to lay it out in a very powerful thing. And listen to Isaiah 45, verse 22. Look unto me and be saved. That is so powerful. Look. He didn't tell you to run. He didn't tell you to beg. He said, just look to me and you will be saved. All the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is none else. You hear what he's saying? There's not another God. So you don't have to look anywhere else. What's our problem? We want our God, but we want to find other gods too. So we want the God of material. We want the God of blessings. We want the God of money. We want the God of, you know, looking good. And those are just other gods. We want one God, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 23, I have sworn by myself, the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Surely shall one say, in the Lord have I righteousness. There it is. How can I be righteous? In Christ, you're going to be righteous. The more of God, the more righteous you're going to be. The more the priests are in harmony with God, the more the nation is going to be blessed. And the same thing here. The more the pastors are on fire, you are going to be on fire because we're going to teach you right. Shall not return unto me. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. Surely shall one say in the Lord, have I righteousness and strength. Even to him shall men come, and all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. And then verse 25, In the Lord shall all the seed of Israel be justified and shall glory. So what he's saying is that this is what God wants to do. He wants to take someone who is not worth it and not worthy, someone who feels so bad about who they are, and someone who's trying to be a real good Christian and yet take their eyes off of God and tell you it's not you. It's going to be God that picks you up. It's going to be God that puts you back together. It's going to be God taking your mind and heart and making you fall in love with him. And it's going to be God saying to those enemies, stay away from him. And it's going to be God who's going to fill you with the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's going to be God that gives you a heart to handle anything. And so it's time to grow up. And I have to grow up under the grace of God. And so the law was a schoolmaster to bring you to Christ. Now that I have Christ, I'm under his grace. Because now I'm so in love with God that he's never going to leave me nor forsake me. And I start believing this thing with all my heart. And so before we dig into it, let's look at a couple things kind of really, really exciting. And so when you look at an epistle, 1st, 2nd Timothy, you know, James and so on, the epistles written to the different churches, Titus, they are not written in chronological orders. In other words, it's not certain ones come first. So Romans is actually the sixth in chronological order, and Romans is first when it comes to Christian doctrine. So if I want Christian doctrine, don't be afraid of doctrine. It means correct belief. If I really want to understand what God is thinking, how God feels, what goes on in God's mind, if I really want to know the mind of God, it's this book. And so when you hear me teach, I like to teach the mind and heart of God, how God acts, his character, his nature, and yet in the middle, God is good and God is just. So all the epistles have a purpose, and here it is. Here in Romans, it speaks of the righteousness of God. In the book of Corinthians, it speaks of order in the church. You remember, they were out of order. In the book of Galatians, it speaks of our liberty in Christ. We have liberty. Don't bind me. In the book of 
Ephesians, if you understand that book, it talks about the calling of God, that you have been predestinated. Now walk worthy of the Lord. In the book of Philippians, it talks about what? The joy of the Lord is our strength. In the book of Colossians, it talks about he's the head. He's Christ. He's everything. The preeminence must go to him. And then in the book of Thessalonica, it is the coming one. Jesus is coming. He's the one who's going to come and conquer. And then lastly, kind of cool, in Hebrews, it talks about this is the substance of everything. So these books are not just written to write them. They were inspired by the Holy Spirit. They have a purpose involved. And so if I really want to understand why my life is out of order, you read Corinthian. Because where there's no spirit, then you're going to have schisms. And the only way you can get rid of a schism is by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That dominates and brings you back under the control of the Holy Spirit. If I feel like I'm being in bondage, then I need to study the book of Galatians. Because it talks about my spirit is made free. And Paul was going to hang on to that one thought. It was not circumcision, but it was you in Christ that makes the difference. And then what can I say about Philippians? It's the joy. You know, in other words, you know, pray always to God. And again, always come. So everything moves in the right direction in a very wonderful way. And that is some of the stuff, the golden nuggets we're going to see through this book. Also, it has to deal with the church starting. We don't know who started it. We know that it was started in Rome. We know that Paul was in Corinthian when he actually wrote the book. And we also know he gave this to a woman to bring to the guys. I like that. So, and he even calls her a deaconess. And so here we find one of the gals was going that way. And so Paul wrote this incredible book of Romans, you know, by hand with his help. And then he gave it to a woman. Guys, can you think about that for a moment? I can't believe it. You do all of that and then you give the manuscript to your wife to drop off. You know, you just you can't. I just. And yet, who was at the tomb? The women. Who was at the cross? The women. Why were the shepherds late? It took them two years to get there because they never asked directions. I'm convinced. A woman would have found Jesus in the tomb, in the crib, right there. But again, why do? Why are we such male chauvinists? Why do we have such a hard time allowing women to be used by God? So I look at the women's ministry. Unbelievable. 700 women can sign up for a retreat in two days. It takes seven years to get 30 guys. It's just sad. And when you think about it, who serves the church? Who's in the nursery taking care of your kids? Women. Who does the front office? Women. Who communicates to make a pastor look good? Women. So a guy is coarse, narrow, rigid. God knew that. He's not going to get off track too quick. But a woman is, I'm not just cold, I'm freezing to death. And I'm not just hungry, I'm starving to death. So they go way up and way down. And that's what we love about it. But when it comes to teaching, then it becomes a whole other thing. But in all in all, Paul surrounded himself with women who love God. And he gave responsibilities to women. So, you know, and with my wife, the way she is, and we've been in house ministries, it's all part of my life to let women be part of ministry and pray and anoint and do all that stuff. And so women are the moral fabric of our country. And so guys will always sin, but now when all of a sudden women start sinning, then the whole moral fabric becomes unwind and we're losing everything. And so women, you have to be strong. And guys, you have to get stronger. And the Bible says, holy men, lift it up your hands and women just worshiping the Lord. And so here, once again, she was able to bring it to them. And so Luther said that it is the chief book of the New Testament. God it said in the, uh, it is the chief walk of the Christian walk. And then this guy named Carol said this, it is the most fundamental, logical, profound, systematic, discussion of the whole plan of salvation in all the literature of the world. It touches all men. It is universal in its application, its roots not only in men's creative and fall, but also 
in the timeless purpose and decree of God before the world was and fruit is in eternal life and afterwards. In other words, it's everything we need. And so we look at the doctrine in 2 Peter 1.21, for the prophecy came not in old times by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved of the Holy Ghost. So I believe the strongest thing we need today in the church is prophetic prophets actually speaking the word of truth. Now I'm not saying that we're going to be like the prophets of the old days. I'm saying that in our teaching we have the gift of knowledge or the gift of discernment or the gift of wisdom. We ought to use it. And we ought to say it like it is and not be afraid. And I think what the world needs today is a clear vision of God. They need a crystal clear picture of what God is and what God is not. And how powerful God is. And someone has to stand up and say it like it is. You cannot tickle ears and you cannot try to win people. Your goal in life is to share God and pronounce God and step up for God and say this is the way it is. And when we can do that, then all of a sudden the church becomes a, a church that has a voice that is going to hear God all the time. If that's not my heart, then I'm in trouble. And a lot of pastors just want to teach a Bible study. We're beyond the Bible study. We need to know what God is saying. We need to live it this day. We need to be under the government of God. And we need to serve God with all of our hearts, with all of our soul. And we have to have a dividing line between us and the world. And we ought to see it. And if we can't see it, someone ought to be saying, this is the way to walk in it. So if you follow God, I'm going to follow you. But I have to see God in your life. And that's who we should be. If it's Pat, if it's me, if it's Kevin, we have to have that much strength in our life. And so here he's saying it is during that third missionary journey, 57 A.D., that he wrote, To all men be in Rome, in chapter 1, verse 7, beloved of God. So they are in Rome. And probably what happened is during the Pentecost when Peter was preaching, 3,000 came to Christ. And so many of those people started churches in their own area. And so they began to work in Rome. And then in Rome 16, verse 1 and 2, it talks about the ladies who were around Paul. And so she was a sister, she was a servant, and she was one who helped and ministered to people. So she had a great heart towards God. The outline can be very simple. In chapter 1 through 8 is doctrine. And that's important. I'm going to explain that in a second. Chapters 1 through 8 is doctrine. Then in chapter 9 through 11 is dispensation. And then lastly, in 12 through 16, we're going to take a look at what is practical. Now, let me go back for a moment. When it comes to doctrine, God never does anything till he shows you first what he's done for you. So when you go to a church and they say, this is what you have to do for God, just turn around and walk out. It should be, this is what God wants to do for you. So Ephesians chapter 1 through 6 and chapters 1, 2, and 3, it's everything that God has done for you, okay? Predestined you, you're his beloved, he's ordained you, he's baptized you, he sealed you, till you come to chapter 4. Now it says, walk ye therefore and be worthy of the Lord. So after everything that God has done, after everything that God has poured into your life, now you are to live it practically out in the world. So first of all, God gives it, then he says, now live it. He'll never ask you to do something that he doesn't empower you. If God is asking you to go and share with your husband, then God will give you the power and the anointing and take the fear away. In other words, God will never do anything in your life until he first empowers you. And it's always that way. Same here in Romans. If you really want to look at it, from chapter 1 to 11 is doctrine. And from chapter 12 to 16 is application. Because what does it say, Romans chapter 12, verse 1? Present your body a living sacrifice. Now, therefore, because of everything I've done in chapters 1 through 11, you give me your body. Because we trust him. So God is seeking to build a relationship in and through your life. And so here we see it. The law revealed sin. Amen? It shows us our sin. God is taking it away. Do you hear it? See, that's just a little slight thing. Well, law reveals you're a sinner, but God took it away. So you're righteous before God. Do you believe that? Well, kind of. I tell you what, I bet you don't feel worthy. No, I bet you feel insecure. Yep, 
Why? Because I feel like I'm a sinner. But you didn't listen to what God said. He came to take it away. So do you believe that or not? If you believe it, victory comes your way. The law reveals guilt. God is giving me peace. You see, I have to give it. I have to take it. I have to receive. I can't do that. I'm so humble and broken. I'm just a little peasant. And he's so big and so great and so mighty. Well, so what? If he's great, big, and mighty, and I'm tiny, little, small, and I can't reach up, and he can't reach down, what do I have? I got a big God and a weak little punk. See, that's what I have. But this Jesus came to bring this weak little punk to this great God. And this great God wanted to come into my heart and live here, but he came through Jesus Christ. So what happens? You begin to love Jesus like you've never loved him before. Because of Jesus, you get this great big God in your life, and he takes everything evil out of your life. Well, I can't do it. Good, you can. I can't break this pornography. No, you can. But it is the Holy Spirit that can do it and give you a brand new heart. He can change you like that, and you never have a desire to go back. And then the law strips a man, but God clothes a man. He took, you remember, Eva Merodach, and he took... Uh, Zechariah, and he clothed them, made him a king once again. As God is in the business of putting clothes of righteousness on you. So pick up that helmet. He takes the filthy rags away, and he does a good work in your heart. He's always clothing you. Satan is always taking. And so here we find, lastly, the law promises death, but God gave you eternal life. You can't die. You see, everything I've mentioned is what the law, well, I hate the law. No, the law is good, just, and holy. Well, Steve, I don't understand. You and I are the guilty ones. The law just brought me to realize how ugly I really am. And now in my ugliness, Jesus comes and makes me absolutely beautiful. So now I can walk down South Bay and not be ashamed or not hang my head because I'm nobody. I'm something. I'm the child of the king. So the righteousness of God, if you accept it, it brings justification. Well, I just don't know if, if I believe in his righteousness, then you're never going to have justification, just as if I'd never done it. In other words, when God gives you justification, he would never look at you because he knows you would never do it. So weird. The justification of God, if you accept it, brings redemption. In other words, if you accept the work of justification, then redemption comes to you. And guess what? If you have redemption and you accept that, you have peace in your heart. So there's a contingency about you accepting what God has done. So yes, God can justify you and sanctify you and glorify you because he made you in the image of God. He made you just like him, except he gave you a free will that we die over. And so Romans has been called the gospel of God. Check it out. In Romans 1.1, it says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated, underlined, unto the gospel of God. Isn't that a cool verse? So the book of Romans is about the gospel of God. It's in a nutshell. And then notice in Romans 1.16, I love this verse. It's the gospel of God, but it says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. So secondly, the gospel of Christ. In verse 1, the gospel of God. In verse 16, it's the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first, also the Greeks. And then number three in Acts chapter 20, verse 24, it is the gospel of grace. It says here, but none of these things moved me, neither counted I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish the course with joy, the ministry which I have received of the Lord to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. Do you believe that? The gospel of God, the gospel of Christ, now the gospel really of the Holy Spirit in the grace of God. Ephesians 1.13, it's the gospel of your salvation. He says, in whom ye also trusted, after ye heard the word of truth, that the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believe, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. He baptized you and sealed you. And so you are going steady with Jesus Christ. That word seal is a word that when you went down to buy wood, hunks of wood or logs of wood, you would brand it with your branding iron, just like they would do a cow. 
you would have to, you'd be taking your things down. You'd have to put it in their fire. And then you would hit your log and you would say, SM. That would be Steve Mays. You're just going to brand it. And I'll come back later on and get it. So maybe three months went by and now you wanted that wood. They would ship it down the rivers to where you had to get it. And it was yours. You already paid. You put a down payment on it. That's the same word the Holy Spirit uses. He gave you a down payment. He sealed you with the Holy Spirit. In other words, it's like God putting a wedding ring on your finger, and you are going steady with God. So you can't flirt. And if you really get this picture, and all of a sudden you're going with God, and you're in love with God, and you're going steady with God, and you're lusting to every woman you look at, I don't think that's a very good relationship to you. I mean, if you're married, are you, oh, look at that chick. Oh, can we walk by Victoria one more time? You know, what, honey, dump me right there. You see, I'm to be in love with one. And I, with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, that nothing can be more attractive because everything that's attractive is going to fall apart and sag one day. And so you're just going down this road of I, I want, I want, and you're not serious about your wife. You don't really want your wife. Well, Steve, it's just the way God made me. God didn't do that. Satan is in your head telling you, look, 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 where God says look to heaven. But if I'm in love with my wife, I won't be doing that kind of stuff because I'm in love. And then when all of a sudden you go out on the Lord and you have fornication or you have adultery, you're committing adultery against God and against your wife. Well, I don't want to do that. I don't want to hurt God, nor do I want to hurt my wife. Forget the church. I don't want to hurt them. And so all of a sudden I've been sealed. Why? Because he's coming back. And those of you that have been sealed, he's going to take up. So I am serious about getting married to my Lord Jesus Christ. And then the gospel of the kingdom in Mark chapter 1, verse 14. Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. So powerful. And one last one. An everlasting gospel, Revelation 14, verse 6. I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Do you get it? The gospel, the good news. So over what is the message of Romans? It is the gospel of God. It is the gospel of Christ. It is the gospel of your salvation. It's everything about you being saved by this great God. And that's what Paul's doing. He's telling you for 16 chapters what God did in Paul's life. How wonderful, how majestic, how precious, how special this Jesus Christ really is in my life. Because he died for my sins and he baptized me in his spirit. And he loves me even when I don't do good. And so how can I walk around having an attitude with God? I mean, what does God think? I mean, I I know how he thinks, I think. Stephen, why are you complaining? Why are you griping? Is nothing that I've done in your life worthy of praise? I mean, come on. And, of course, I get convicted, but he's right. I'm ashamed. And it's the goodness of God that brings me to repentance. So I find now, God, I'm sorry. Why? Because I feel so bad that you're so good that I haven't even said hi today to you. Steve, are you okay? Yeah, I'm finally getting okay. But that's what we used to call the Jesus people. When all of a sudden, everything we did, we lived, we moved, we had Jesus in our life. And by the way, has Jesus been good to you lately? Do you love him with all your heart? Are you singing? Or did you come today like, I paid good money to hear this concert. (laughs) I like that preacher's voice. You know, I don't, he hurts me sometimes, but I like him. Okay, you keep coming back, why? Why? Because there's something in your heart that you want to be fed. That's what's so cool. And then Paul presents his credentials, and we'll end up in the last four things. Number one, verse one, he is a broken man. I want to give you five things to think about with all your heart until we come back next week. Number one, why did God use Paul? He was a broken man. Look at it says Paul. Well, his real name is Saul. But the word Paul means little. I am the least of all the saints. In other words, when God nailed him on the Damascus road, he was fumbling down, couldn't see, he was blinded. And another one had to pick him up 
and another one had to come and touch his eyes, Ananias, and it was God that revealed, Paul, why are you kicking against the prick? Why are you hurting my people? When Paul thought he was doing God's will. That's how bad it can get. Because in your heart, you're governed by the law. You're governed about what you think, but you're not listening to what God says. And all of a sudden, God opened his eyes, and God took him. He was the most incredible scholar of his day. But why would God do that? Because God didn't have to do much. Once he would turn Paul and turn the light on, then everything he was doing this way, he'd now do this way. So if I would serve the devil this way, I ought to be serving Jesus Christ this way. But I don't understand how you're serving the devil this way, and then you come over here and just kind of walk around and don't get involved, don't make a commitment, and don't make a sacrifice. I don't understand that. Because I think that, really, if Jesus Christ took you out of the pit, put your feet upon the rock, took darkness out of your life, and brought you into the marvelous life, you should be doing so much better and so much more power that you are in debt for the rest of your life. And who cares about anybody else? Um, Why criticize them when I can't even live it myself? And when I look at the Sermon on the Mount and I say I can climb that, you don't understand. You can't climb that mountain. It's impossible. You can't go under it. You can't go through it. The only way you can go over it is with God taking you over it himself. When Joshua went into the valley or into the stream, it says that they took the stones, another one put them on their shoulders. I need another one to pick up my body and take it. Otherwise, I'm not going to make it. You see, Paul says, I'm fully persuaded in that which I have committed, that he's able to keep it to the end time. No, I can do it. That's all I hear, ever hear around this place. I can do it. We can do it. No, you can't do it. You can't do nothing except get yourself in a lot of trouble. But those that surrender can do anything. And so we take our eyes off of God, we fall, and then we try to get back right with God without even repenting because we do not want that relationship because we know that when we have a relationship, we're going to have to make a commitment. So we figure this thing out where Satan has. Hey, you want to play church? Go for it. You want to sit in church? Go for it. You want to listen to teaching? Go for it. Don't you dare make a commitment. You see? Satan's come in and said like, you know, Pharaoh said to Moses, okay, take the kids, but, you know, don't take any sheep. (laughs) What? We have to make a sacrifice. God will deal with us. Oh, okay, then you go, but don't go too far. What do you mean? We need to get as far as away as we can from you. So Pharaoh, every challenge Moses made, Pharaoh challenged, okay, you go without your kids. Okay, you go without the animals. Okay, you go, but don't go too far. What is Satan doing? He's giving you your heart's desire but he's dictating what you can do and how far you can go. Who's in charge of your life, Satan or the Spirit? And so I would say we're going to take the animals because we have to sacrifice. Because if we don't worship, we're going to be dealt with by God. We have to take our children, otherwise we're going to lose the next generation that's going to serve God. And we have to get away from here, otherwise people are going to be looking at this Jehovah and this corruption, and they're going to have to make a, a, a difference. Why? Get away. Move on. And so number one, a broken man for God's kingdom, Paul, he was separate unto God. He he was just little. He was so broken, devastated. He said, God, what would you have me do? In fact, when he was knocked down, what did he say? He said, Lord, ready, what would you have me to do? That is incredible. That's a conversion. Lord, he acknowledged Jesus as Lord, and then he said, what would you have me to do? He surrendered. Boy, if I could have that, that'd be wonderful. Then when God said to him, I'm going to show you the great things you're going to have to suffer for my name's sake, he didn't quit. He had an iron will, and that iron went through his body, and you could not get him away. And so he stood against the nation and against all the criticism, and he fought for grace. And because of that, we have it today, the grace of God. It's not someone bragging in heaven about how they got there. It's by the grace of God we're saved, not of works, lest any man should boast. Thank God we're going to go to heaven, take off our crowns, and throw them at the feet of Jesus. It's you and you only, God, that's been faithful in my life. Number two, he is a broken man. Second, he is a servant of Jesus Christ. Notice, a servant of Jesus Christ. Just a bond servant. And what can I say? A bond servant has no authority, no rights. So why are we offended? Because I don't like that. 
Well, I thought you were a servant. Well, I am. No, you're not. You're acting like a lord. Well, you know, I have some say. No, you don't. You're a slave. You have given up your right. You now have surrendered to the Lord and to the Spirit, and you now are servants of the Most High God. And you have been in debt, and now you have a debt to pay. But because of the goodness of God, you have surrendered. Now, all of a sudden, you're not going to die to who you are. So if I'm doing a funeral, and you're in that little casket, and no one's looking, but I see you have a Rolex watch that isn't tick, 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 but one of those $35,000 ones, you know what I'm talking about? And I take it off your wrist, and the guy jumps up and put that back on me. He ain't dead. That boy is still alive right here. You see, you tell me you're dead, but you're acting in the flesh. You're after body appetites. If you're dead, you don't care. If someone offends you, Yes, it hurts, but you're not going to give up. You're going to die. You're going to beat your body into submission. You're going to yield. You're going to reckon the old man dead. See, that's Christianity. That's that incredible brokenness and now a servant of the Most High God. I'm going to serve. And that's why people will not hire Christians. That's why people will not make a commitment to Christians because they will not make a commitment. And they do not do things with all their heart, 110%. They just do what they have to do. Some of you are not that way, I'm sure. But the rest of us, we are. Because we don't finish well. Because we have other things in our mind. This is for keepsake. This is everything. We're coming down now to everything. And thirdly, in verse 1, he was an apostle of the church. So he was a broken man in God's kingdom. And by the way, the most dangerous person in the world is that unbroken Christian. It's damning to the church. Second, he is a servant of Jesus Christ. Third, He's an apostle of the church. In other words, he's to build up the body of Christ. And notice, he was called. It wasn't something that he I want to be a teacher, or I want to be this, or I want to be that. He, no, God gave him a gift. And if God gives you a gift, then do it. If God's given you the gift of giving, give it, because you're going to get more. You know, George Mueller, when he died, had 75 cents in his hand, but he prayed in $7 million back in those days. In other words, there's all kinds of stories. If you have the gift of administration, then ministrate in the Spirit. Not just do physical things, but see a person spiritually and build their spiritual life up. I don't know why we don't do that at work. We don't have to talk about Jesus, but we could talk about ethics. You know, my degree's in ethics, so we could do that. But just to get a church clean is one thing, but to get the church clean and mentor people, that's where it's at. So every one of us have to mentor. You mentor your children. You know, you teach them. You work with them. You build them up. And so here, he's an apostle, called to be an apostle, a sent one. And then number four, he is separate unto himself. Look at verse 1 through 4. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, to be an apostle, separated unto God, which he had promised afore by the prophets in the Holy Scripture, concerning his son Jesus Christ, Our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness. In other words, he was that separate person. He was separated by holiness. So if I'm going to be a sent one, then I have to be like Isaiah. And God touched his lips, and he felt the pain and the smoke and the burning of his lips. And when God says, who can I find to go? Isaiah said, I'm ready. I'll go. You've touched my mouth. You've sanctified my life. You've given me a second chance. I'll go and I'll represent you, God. I will not tint the water. I will not touch your name. I'll honor your name. That's the ambassador we want. And then lastly, so powerfully, he is a preacher of the gospel in verse 4, declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. What's Paul saying? The dead, the resurrection, the power, the anointing, and holiness. That's all teaching. He was a preacher. And one time in Philippi, he says, you know, here I am in prison. Some preach Christ with envy and strife. Nevertheless, Christ is being preached. I therein rejoice. What he's saying is that I'm in the dungeon, and these people now see me in the dungeon, and so they're taken over up above. And they're doing what they want. Some preach Christ with envy and strife. Some preach Christ with contention, and this is Paul's attitude, notwithstanding, 
Christ is being preached. I don't care. Just preach Jesus. Well, they're talking about me. and You know, who cares? If your name gets to heaven, that's all that counts. So let them talk bad about you, good about you. Just bring my name before God. That's all I want. You know, you don't want to be weird. But you have to understand that there's a time and a place and then he was a missionary, in verse 5, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to faith among all nations for his name, among whom we are also the called of Jesus Christ. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. In other words, when I look at this whole story, just starting off, we'll, we'll grab verse 2 next week, but just the whole thing wrapped together I'll say the book of Romans is going to be a book that brings us out of this horrible situation and brings us to the top. There used to be a cigarette commercial. I think Wendell would remember. And it says, Cools. And then the commercial was, Come up. Come all the way up to Cools. I always think about the Lord. Come up. Come all the way up to Christ. In other words, let him be the preeminent one in your life. Let him be the Lord of your life. Don't stop short. Because he is going to show you how much he loves you. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your grace in our lives. And God, as we have communion tonight, we dedicate this night. And we pray that you would so touch our hearts that we would come to believe in the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was for me. And God, you have set me free by your spirit and by God, that spirit of liberty in my life. In Jesus' name, amen.